name is Vijay Prashad and I uh, am a teacher, I write, uh, I'm also uh, a Marxist, as you said, <laughs> and you were sitting back there, a horror, a war horror. Actually, I'm worse than that because I'm also a communist, which is the worst thing in the world. <laughs> and so my interest has always been in the fate of not the planet, not humanity, not really civilization, but the class question. You know, why is it that working class people, peasants, industrial workers, manufacturing workers, workers who fish off coastal regions, people who struggle to find work, who now we know as the precariat, why is it that the mass of working people uh, have, have found in their own practice in lives over the last 35, 40 years, that existence has become even more difficult now, despite the fact that it has been difficult under the regime of capitalism for a long time. But there's been an intensified difficulty, and this has led to wars, it has led to displacement, it has led to immense amount of violence. So my interest in the question of the environment isn't from a standpoint of the planet or anything like that. It's really from the standpoint of, you know, the majority of the world's people who uh, do most of the world's labor and have the least of the world's power. Um, hi everyone, my name is Paulina Helmer-Nandes and I'm joining you all from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I work with an organization called Southern Earth on New Ground. So yes, <laughs> uh, and we're a Southern Regional um, Gay, Lesbian, Bi, and Trans organization that works at the intersection of racial and economic justice and gender and sexual liberation. And so a lot of my work uh, definitely focuses around engaging LGBT people around this question of like, what is our shared destiny? And so where are we going together? Um, and I myself, my, I'm originally from Veracruz, Mexico. I grew up in Mexico until I was 12. Uh, and then my parents, you know, uh, the, after the North American Free Trade Agreement, both, every, basically every generation of my family, as far back as we can remember, were farm workers in both sides of my family, um, especially from the coastal region of Mexico that we're from. And um, after NAFTA happened, uh, my parents lost their small business, and my father trekked across the U.S.-Mexico border to go to North Carolina uh, and work there uh, as a farm worker for a year before he brought the rest of my family over from Mexico. So my sort of earliest memories of like becoming politicized were very much in the context of like what was happening in farm working communities in North Carolina with the use of Latino immigration coming into the southeast um, and just the end that like um, absolutely kind of to this, to this question of class instead of who's seen as disposable and who's seen as you know uh, just yeah just like labor that is okay but like you know that at the time in North Carolina there is very few almost non-existent regulations around farm working and around like even exposure to pesticides so very common for irrigation sort of things would happen over the field that people were still working on and people would not be alerted to leave the field. Mm -hmm. And then our people were going home generationally sick with cancer or people were going home to die more and more. Um, and it just like, it was like a huge kind of wake up call like, you know, when my father was like beginning to get sick around some of the um, stuff when he was being exposed to different pesticides. Um, and he actually was the first person in his family who went to college. And he was one of the people who was like asking all kinds of questions and like what's actually happening. And I think it just, from like an earlier memory, just remember being like, oh, okay, I see what's happening. Like the land of opportunity for like some of us and then like the land of like death for many of us, right? And I think that there was like something also just about like being from Mexico from a farm working like family and always like knowing that our people have like studied the stars, that people have studied the sun, they've studied like of every sign of what actually supported life and what gave us life, you know? Um, and I think that there was like a way also like that like historically, like as part of like descendant of like the Mexican Revolution too, and like around like land reform issues that he felt very important as a central value. That like the land belongs to the people that work it. And ultimately like we're the ones that bear the consequences and bear the front, right, of most of the environmental destruction. So my work, I feel like in the South, so like it's in some ways so also rooted around land because we have such a strong sense of place, you know, and around sort of like who does the land belong to and like how do we also make it sustainable for people to remain there. Um, and I think it's been sort of coming back full circle to actually think about this kind of a question of some collective survival at this point around like what are we actually willing to do for each other to transform what's actually at ready at play. So this is the third in the dialogue series and the first one we were taking a look at the scale of the body uh, in relation to climate change and in the second the scale of the community and tonight we're looking at the scale of the nation state. So I think it's interesting that um, I'm, I'm very
very excited to talk to both of you about it because I think you bring uh, really interesting perspectives to the discussion. Uh, in particular, with the work with Song, uh, it, it, it's a formation of people that have come together around identity, yet um, understanding how uh, identity and self-determination um, relate to struggles that connect to decisions made by the nation state. And um, sort of uh, struggling with the relationship between your identity and So I want, I want to um, sort of jump into um, a series of questions about the nation state as the vehicle for addressing climate change. It's been the sort of de facto vehicle. So uh, mainstream environmentalists or uh, big green NGOs have very much focused their energy and attention on the nation state in advocating for national policies. And I wanted to ask um, for you to comment on that, what you think about that as the predominant No, I think I, I love this question. I love this question because I um, thinking about uh, I think about this from a variety of different ways, um, and one of them is also just about like the question of indigenous sovereignty, of like where where are we actually? What are some of the decisions that we're making in terms of trying to even address some of our social problems that either sort of put us closer into the bind of empire or take us closer to liberation and indigenous sovereignty or actually acknowledging sort of like some of the historical, I feel like it, like historical sort of pivots in time that actually have made us more and more dependent on systems that actually benefit from our suffering. You know, and I think that like there's a lot of ways in which like the state absolutely oftentimes like benefits from our suffering. Um, and in the South, like it's so, it's just so hard to like separate like the wealth of what's happening. You know, like we, we talk about it all the time, we go to places like beautiful places in the South, like Charleston, South Carolina, where you're like, this is such a beautiful city, it's so magnificent, it's so, you know, like all these colonial designs, and then you're like, of course, because it was a slave port city, and all of this wealth and beauty was built on the back of slavery, right? And so I think that there's always been sort of like this like intent intensive um, relationship in terms of like that the uprise of wealth, like it's happening at somebody's expense. And so to me, like the question of like nation state, oftentimes that comes back to this like lack of imagination almost around what else is possible. Like what are all of the other formations and ways that like our people have so much? You know, talking about like all the different ways of like kinship networks. And in some ways, Song thought of itself as a kinship network in the beginning. Uh, of a kinship network of saying, we do have shared identity. And this was also at the time that the, that the primarily gay and lesbian movement was saying, why are we talking about globalization? This is not a lesbian issue. This is not a gay issue. Why are we talking about economics? This has nothing to do with my gay marriage. Right, and actually us pushing our people to be like, well, actually, let's talk about that. Right, like how the state benefits from all of our benefits come, uh, you know, happening through couplehood. And do we want to keep sort of replaying the same sort of dynamics and the same sort of, um, I don't know, almost like constricted choices around our lives. And there's like a way that like the, the nation state question has to come to the detriment of like what actually really powerful local organizing is happening where people are redefining like their accountability to land their accountability to each other, and actually wanting to sort of make up a different kind of social safety net that oftentimes the country, we're in such a cultural war right now around whether there should even be a, a social safety net. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're putting all of our solutions on this like safety net that like there's an active movement to constantly undermine and kind of putting everything on that one plate. I don't know, I don't know about y'all, I think about organizing as kind of a guerrilla fight, like all strategies all the time. Yeah. And see what sort of happens and what sticks, and I think that like there's something about like actually being willing to think from, a, from an internationalist perspective that just cracks us open in a different way, you know? Uh, you know, one of the nice things about Naomi Klein's book, which I was very happy uh, reading, was the slogan. You know, you read a book, and books are interesting, and, and Naomi has an incredible way of synthesizing immense amount of uh, information and, you know, analysis. But you've got to have a slogan. And the slogan that you remember is climate versus capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's a choice. It's like Rosa Luxemburg. Civilization or barbarism. Socialism or barbarism was Luxembourg saying. It's a great slogan. I think bringing the word capitalism and the analysis of capitalism into the discussion about climate is essential. I mean, what's happened is, I don't, I believe that there's no such thing as a state. 
Then different states have different class configurations. It depends who's controlling and driving the agenda in the state. So, you know, you're going to need to have an international set of negotiations over climate. That has to be taking place. Other scales, different kinds of things have to happen. But there has to be an international form of negotiation. The problem is that there are states in the planet that are so heavily emboldened to the forces of capitalism, to what we call the 1%, that they suffocate any dialogue. And they throw this sort of very disturbing dust into uh, the media, where they talk about, for instance, well, the, the poor countries, developing countries, don't want to meet obligations. We meet obligations because, of course, America is the best country in the world. And we all, we're going to get rid of plastic bags. And we're going to recycle bottles. And, you know, we're going to put solar panels up in our Charleston, South Carolina, beautiful downtown, but it will be disguised. So we won't ruin the facade. We're better people than anybody else in the planet. The Chinese are the worst people. So there's this sort of jingoistic language that the 1% or, you know, the capital, that will sprinkle through the media to disrupt any attempt at having a serious dialogue about the fact that the property classes simply do not want to change the direction of social development. Now, I'll give you a silly example. You know, I live in Western Massachusetts. For now, much longer months of the year, it's freezing cold. Everybody, including me, has a house which we heat. You know, we live in an apartment or a house and we have heat. So that means your apartment is fighting against sub-zero temperature outside. And then, we buy these obscenely large refrigerators. We sit inside our kitchens, which keep things cold against the heating that we're doing. We fight against the cold outside. Then in the refrigerator, we have a freezer box above there, which is intensifying cold to freeze things against the heat, against the cold. And then inside the freezer box, there's a heating coil to prevent the freezer box from freezing over. <laughs> this capitalist civilization that we all participate in is insane. <laughs> and yet we believe that some Chinese peasant or an Indian peasant are the problem. Because we recycle our bodies. So what has happened, I think, I believe, to reimagining these issues is that we are utterly complicit in the fact that Obama goes to Copenhagen and says that I'm going to cut a deal, but it will be on our terms. Which means that capitalism cannot be disrupted. And I think what Naomi has done, at least to open this conversation, is to say, look, actually it's a choice. Van Jones is wrong. There is no green job solution. There is no capitalist solution to the climate problem. In fact, capitalism is the problem. And I mean, it's a huge thing to say so because it sounds like, oh my god, okay. I thought it was okay and easy to fix the warming problem. You know, we could do that. We can't fix the capitalism problem. Mm. In other words, this scalar problem which is about the whole planet seems easier to fix. <laughs> then this social problem of corruption and theft, which we feel immobilized from fixing, which I find it means that we have lost our minds. Because we actually think that these, you know, there are new concepts in the academy, anthropomorphism, anthropo yeah. anthrop anthropocene. anthropocene. You know, why do we need new terms when actually older terms make sense? Those new terms obfuscate the fact that the problem here is we've organized our social system so badly that our culture has become reliant on the social system. So we cannot imagine having a box in which we put our meat, close the box, and put it in the outside. It's unimaginable. Uh -huh. So culturally, we are wedded to a social system that is dominated by a very small number of people, and we feel we can't change that. That's extraordinary. Edward Abbey said capitalism is the ideology of the cancer cell, unlimited growth in a finite system. Mm -hmm. uh, I am thinking about, um, both of you brought up this uh, issue directly, I think, um, about how with climate change there's such a vast asymmetry in the burden of responsibility and the burden of impact. 
And that plays out at the community scale, and that's what we call the climate justice movement within the United States. Too. But it certainly also plays out on um, the scale of the, the nation state and the global scale. Um, and, and so that's getting me to a question about um, the global south, the construction of the global south. UJ, I know you've written a lot about this. What are some of the mainstream understandings of the global south, and how should we think differently about the global south? Why might that be important? It's a huge issue, and it's a very important issue. I think one of the problems that um, we face is we, we decontextualize tragedies in the South. And I think I use the term South generously to include the American South and the South in the US North, and et cetera. There is a decontextualization. So for instance, I'll give you an example, not journey directly. In Ebola epidemic hits in West Africa, and suddenly, you know, Americans, you know, we always learn our geography through tragedy. Either who we're bombing or if there's some place where the Marines need to go. Like, there's an Ebola tragedy, send in the Marines. What? You know, there's kids don't know how to spell in Liberia, send in the Marines. But there's kids who don't know how to spell in America, send in the Marines. Because they wanted to bring troops and send them into classrooms. I don't know if you saw that. Anyway. It's decontextualized. Why is there an epidemic of Ebola in West Africa? Well, all the countries which had an outbreak of Ebola suffered from IMF, International Monetary Fund, strictures during the debt crisis, where they were told that if you want a bridge grant to carry you through your debt crisis, you're going to have to cut back on state spending. The two arenas they cut back were health and education. So they, in the 1980s and 90s, Liberia, you know, Sierra Leone eviscerated, destroyed their health sector. And then 20 years later, there's an Ebola epidemic, and we're sitting back and saying, it's Africa, because they're black. That's why they have diseases. They're not like us, you see. By the way, the French believed this in 1832, when the cholera came from Asia. The French says, we are Democrats. Democracy is antithetical to cholera. The cholera wiped out Paris. They didn't prepare for it at all. They thought cholera is a despotic disease. You know, these ideas are alive and well today. Ebola is a disease of Africa. It's not a disease of Africa. It's a disease of the evisceration of public health. Mm -hmm. If you don't finance public health, you're going to get a disease. You know, if you're not going to allow farmers in Mexico to grow corn, they're going to come northward. Because they have no choice. You've destroyed the ability for them to farm. So the geography of the understanding of the global south is decontextualized. We only see tragedy. And if you only see tragedy, then you see these people as victims. Mm -hmm. And then you say, we have to raise charity to help them because, you know, they just can't help themselves. So we don't actually see people as people. That means that when there are people struggling to get on a boat across the Mediterranean, we just see them as tragedy, not as narrative. <coughs> because if you see them as narrative, not as tragedy, you are part of the story. Because then we get implicated, because then it's about trade policy internationally. Then it's about what the IMF and the World Bank do. Then it's about arms sales to Central Africa to protect the ability of big multinationals from bringing out diamonds, from bringing out coal to hand, etc. We don't want narratives. Narratives make us implicated. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is the great fortune of living in the global north is that you can believe your lives are great and everybody else is just tragic. And I think that we have to change. Their lives are not tragedy. It's part of a narrative, just as our lives are part of a narrative. Right. Helena, I'd love to hear what you have to say, but also want to ask you if you could comment a little bit on the song's model. I um, read that in the political education work that you do, you connect the local issues always to a global context. You know, you know, I was thinking about this um, question of the, the global south and the um, kind of in the international imagination too, like this. Um, it is it's so easy to be US centric in so many in so many ways because I was I was like literally like the, the US like the global south is like hundred and fifty seven out of like hundred and eighty four of like recognized nation states in the world, right? So you're talking about like the large majority of nation states. That actually, to me, like also has to do with like the ongoing sort of struggle around like self-governance for people of color. That it is like there is ultimately to me like 
a white supremacist lens under which a lot of this, like, even the environmental crisis is often has to be addressed by. Because it's like, no, 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 the assumption is like, yes, and then developed nations and those real nations have no accountability. Or like a reduced kind of accountability because of the infrastructure that oftentimes, like, the global south has to respond to this kind of crisis. And there's just, I know that that's part of also kind of driving us a little bit nuts. It's kind of like the almost like the fucking test, like the mind, you know, of like what's happening, like around some of it. That I think that there is like a way that it comes home to roost in like a racial justice movement here in the U.S. as well. Um, and I think that like for some, like we came to this question around like how do you address, like how do you talk about these issues intersectionally, and how do you address them intersectionally without ending up? I don't know how many people have been to like um, strategy meetings or even like mappings of you know like a community trying to assess what's happening, and then you come out with like a list of priority of issues and it's like no less than like 30 things. Anybody? Maybe it's just me. Like I go to organizing meetings and we would like come up with like a laundry list of issues and people are like, we need to address, you know, international military policy in order to be able to address what's happening at the US-Mexico border, mm -hmm. right? And how militarizes that. And so all these things that like we know are like huge issues and we have like we just like have like a human necessity to like try to understand them from a humane level. Um, and so one of the ways that we sort of talk about that is um, intersectionality is that we talk about it in the context of sort of like what are some of the things that we are all affected by and then what are some things that like I think we have to do with like our shared survival. Um, and so one of the ways that we talk about that is through sort of this like four sort of um, this sort of like four lens um, on their sort of what are issues around related to land, body, work, and spirit. And literally like spirit and like the widest sort of manifestation, not like the Holy Spirit. Or like literally like how is our like our personal spiritual resiliency around some of these issues because oftentimes like that's what informs the tenor of our responses. Um, and so there is like a way that like we do like quite a bit of like the mapping um, that we do in the region around land is so much around this question of autonomy and this question of self-determination and do we have a right as people to have self-determined lives? And what does that actually look like on a mass scale? For, you know, both like at the local level but also as a nation sort of, you know, like cover one of those decisions. And that oftentimes like again, like it's back to this question of, um, not just racial justice, but like literally like sovereignty, like what kind of sovereignty, and how are we going to also actualize, like even our idea of citizenship in this country has been such a huge, um, I come out of also because of, you know, from organizing, I come out of immigrant rights work, and so much in some ways of like the trap of like the immigrant rights movement right now is this question of like, once we get citizenship, everything will be okay. And I'm like, really? Like talk to black folks in the South about what citizenship looks like. And then we can have a real conversation about how far we think that this is gonna take us, right? Versus actually like, in some way, like being able to crack the conversation up and of like, what is our relationship? What kind of relations do we wanna to have to each other? And are we willing to do what's necessary to do that? Um, and I think for some, like it's been a question of moving absolutely beyond identity because there is a way that, um, and this, I, mean, I think that this is the kind of how we learn things through crisis. It's like this like constant, also struggle to work against our own scarcity and our own sort of idea that like somebody else has to be starving in order for us to have a, have a steak dinner, you know, or like somebody else has to do without in order for us to, um, in order for us to come here. And I think that there is like a way that that it has um, it has there's like a way that it's not just because I used to think about it as kind of like well we're, what is it about human nature that sometimes like we're like a little bit you know like we're a little bit of like haters like sometimes we're like well, we're the best and like that's the thing that I'm like I love sports I'm a very competitive person huge like women's sports fan. <laughs> um, and just uh, watching like some of like one of my own competitive edge is kind of like, well, how much is, is that? It's about like us flexing as like people that have been oppressed and come out of like history of oppression and being like, yes, like we, it's, it's about us now. Um, versus being like, actually, yes, and like we're sort of like our seventh generation plan. Mm -hmm. You know, that a lot of, we know that, like that's part of the neoliberal agenda, right? Like, you know, that's part of the like the rights agenda. Like we are where we are because they had a 20 generation plan. Mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, put us in the place that we're at and we're actually considering whether or not, like, people will have clean drinking water, you know, and I think that, like, there's, like, a way that we do have to have some historical accountability, and particularly for white people in this country, I feel like there's a different conversation and a different role for white people in this moment in time around, like, what's actually this conversation of political, um, this whole conversation around, like, what is, like, even, like, the conversation around, like, how people are, like, well, the next president is going to be the one that fixes the next great big leader, and I'm like, this is actually, all these decisions are getting made at the local and state level, at least in the South, too, like, in terms of, like, who has access to the water aquifers, you know, the, like, meet between, like, Tennessee, Georgia, um, Tennessee and Georgia, and, like, who actually gets, the, who actually gets rights, you know, like, the rights to the water, and Atlanta's, like, one of the biggest cities in the South, where I live at, Atlanta's, like, hello, we bring the most money, 
So who do you think is gonna get that water? You know, and I think that like it's gonna happen more and more. Like the water wars are gonna come home like in a deeper way more and more. We're seeing that in California, we're seeing that in the Southwest, playing out in a way that I think is gonna make a lot of us very uncomfortable around our decisions, around governance, and around like what do we really believe that is actually needed to change that. I'm gonna ask a follow-up question to that because um, it, you know, I I've been thinking a lot about how we understand the land and our relationship to resources, you know, the um, the the primary push at the nation level around climate change has been for carbon markets, the creation of a new market, right? Modifying an element, um, if, you know, that we've done so much with the definition of capitalism, right? And so it's like you could pick that understanding of nature as something to be carved up, commodified, privatized, sold off to the highest bidder against an understanding of nature as a way of the commons for all of us for generations to come. Um, yet, how does that drive with the discourse on sovereignty? So, it, you know, is there a tension between the commons and sovereignty, particularly because I think sovereignty is an issue that comes up when you're, um, uh, especially when you're, um, you know, dealing with First Nation communities, um, and, and so I'm wondering how to reconcile that. Um, that That's a very good question. I mean, I think, you know, like, we, a lot of us come where like even the ownership of land is suspect. Why should people own land when we're here for one generation? I mean, a like hundred years if you're really, really lucky, right? Um, and I think that like there is, like, and that to me is like is what I go back to when I think about indigenous. It's like, do we actually have the right to like own land as indigenous people? Like, or does the communities own land? Do tribes own land? You know, and like, for example, like, the, like how it's getting, I mean, it's one of the sharpest ways that I think it gets contrasted too, like with the Israeli and Palestine conflict. And it's like, who historically, like, you know, like, who does the land actually belong to? But it's, and the sort of idea of ownership, and that to me feels like the source I see of capitalism, mm -hmm. is that we will always be in this constant fight around who holds ownership over what we all need. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that, like, there is, like, a way that, like, to me, indigenous sovereignty isn't about uh, that, well, I can't claim to say what all indigenous people would say on this, but I feel like for, like, for my people, the question isn't about, like, are we really gonna send everybody back on the, <laughs> you know, like back to Europe? Is that what's going to happen? Are we going to have like mass deportations of ETA? Like what, what's, what's the end game here? No, just on a practical level, right? Like what's the end game here? And to me, I'm like, we've come too far along, like as a, as a people, as a continent to pretend that like our people are not blended and or do not have common ancestry. To me, the real question is what, is, what are we doing to, his, to correct our own historical mistakes, right? And what are we doing to actually like, it's, and then that's why to me like environmental justice work and, and um, racial justice would feel like such spiritual prophecy. It's either like, do you want to live or don't you? Because it's about to get more real up here, and it's about to get more hostile, and we're seeing that play out in all of our cities. We're seeing that play out across all our cities right now that people that have historically been oppressed said no more. And if you're ready for that fight, then bring it. You know, and I think that like, and I think that like, it's changed the tenor of the conversation even around environmental justice. You know, because there's been so much more directness and pointedness around some of the, the I feel like, consequences of of some of that. So for me, like, there is like a question around like, what's our end term, what, what's sort of our end game? Um, and for me, I'm like, I absolutely feel like we can evolve and coexist. I think the question is who will make it to that. Um, yeah. So you brought up, uh, it's about to get more real. It's true, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, the, I, I think of some of the sectors that have been thinking about this and planning around it for a very long time are the military, the Pentagon, the Army, et cetera. Um, and that we're seeing now when we have extreme climate-related events, often militaristic responses rather than humanitarian ones, case in point, Katrina. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in the connections between militarization, uh, climate disaster preparedness, and climate change. Uh, yeah, well, uh, by the way, unfortunately, the term humanitarianism has become military as well. So I think we lost that term. Uh, you know, the great President Obama is, you know, is uh, ambassador to the United Nations. Samantha Power, great name, uh, has basically suborned the term humanitarianism from our side. And, you know, it's uh, corrupted it. But anyway, point the point, this is a tough issue because on the one side, um, the small number of people 
who believe, and, and by the way, this is partly to do with climate and partly to do with the social catastrophe. Because we've seen this preparedness happen for the social catastrophe as well. You know, gated communities, uh, freeways that basically dive into underground parking lots. You can take elevators up or helicopters that fly from the Hamptons to the top of a the Goldman Sachs building. You know, you, you don't have your descent. You don't meet the riffraff. You know, the paranoia of uh, Tom Wolfe's uh, book, which opens with a car getting off on the wrong exit and a flat tire, and this white couple from you know Westchester or somewhere is suddenly confronted by darkness, and you know the fear of paranoia of the class that fears the social consequences of the social catastrophe. So they've been planning for the catastrophe over generations. It's the social catastrophe, hence codes against what slaves can do. You can only walk here, you can only do that. You can't come near me. If you come near me, your head has to be down. You know, power has planned for catastrophe for a long time. So this is part of a long process. But what's interesting is the reason I say this is that in all previous instantations of its preparedness, it has been shown to be useless. It has no idea how to actually hold back the flood. You know, uh, th these are fantasies of power. I, I read the preparedness study by the Pentagon. It's absurd. It's a, it's a little game. It, it, it would make a great video game. You know, you s jump in and you seize the water. Really? You, what did you do in Iraq? You bombed the shit out of that country. You, sent, you occupied it and people were happy and you pacified the country. No, it didn't work. It failed. If it failed in Iraq, it's going to fail when you parachute in to steal the aquifer somewhere. Because, you know, these people are going to shoot at you. They're going to blow their bodies up in your face. So, actually, it's the idea that power, in a sense, is historic. But power doesn't have a future. What power has is not a future, but an endless present. It wants to maintain the present forever. We have a future. We need to articulate the politics of the future. They don't actually have imagination. They want to create the status quo forever. That's not an imagination. So I don't even give them the credibility of planning. What they are trying to do is lengthen a disaster. But we have to save the planet. And I think we are so scared of being aggressive with our ideas. We are so caught in this defensive posture that we have to critique the power, critique power. You know what? I critique power, yes, but we must also supersede it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, our critique should not end. The last chapter of a book is depressing. <laughs> you know, and, and we're all going to die. I mean, you know, even <coughs> popular culture is ahead of intellectual thinking. I don't know how many of you saw Godzilla. <laughs> I'm the only one. You and me. Okay. Three of us, four, five. <laughs> The United States government cannot deal with this creature that it's discovered. Godzilla has to come and save America. I don't know, if you see it, you know what I mean. Godzilla comes from the deep and beats down this character that eats nuclear weapons. So we fire nuclear weapons and it gets stronger. But it's Godzilla that saves the planet. So Americans can't even save the planet. I was watching the Avengers. The Avengers can't save the planet. They've got to go back in time to redo history because it's just screwed up. <laughs> so popular culture recognizes that power doesn't know how to fix things. It needs Godzilla. It needs a time machine. You know, why are we so prone and you know not confident in our ideas? They don't have any answers. We have answers. We should declare them boldly. Well, I'm a huge um, fan of Naomi Klein's work. And I her book, The Shock Doctrine, just mm -hmm. like so helped to kind of um, clarify, kind of demystify a lot of the things. So like, yeah, like somebody who grew up in the Southeast, like a plane steam constantly playing out some disaster capitalism, and you wait for the right moment, you wait for the next environmental disaster, which we obviously also have end up being. But you know, this like sort of, you know, environmental disasters um, happen, and then you just, yeah, you just use them as a way to, create, to clean in some ways the political slate. And the social, the social slate, right? Um, and to me, I'm like the function of FEMA in and of itself as an agency has been around population control. We know that, like that's a historical sort of like rootedness in some ways of like the, the of the federal agency and its scope was to like 
kind of in the context of like emergency preparedness, but also very much around population control. Around like there are actually like I mean you can and I'm a, and I'm a dork so I like research this kind of stuff and uh, you know and also some of the stuff that like you know, we find like in home research like has uncovered right like not just a sort of idea that like I think I sometimes like my own like sci-fi brain I'm like they're, they're not really there's not really government like concentration camps like right. I don't know, and there are, right? We know that there are. And when Katrina happened, it was all too easy. It was all too easy to round up people that have lost everything mm -hmm. and put them in a place where you actually contain them and you know, and, and then get to sort of clear the city for the new wave of tourists, you know? And that's what happened, like, and that's what happened, of course. And like, we saw that play out and we're seeing that play out over and over again in different ways. And to me, I'm like, I actually believe that there is a positive role for government. I'm not all the way out of like, the government has no role, no hand, it shouldn't have, I'm not there. I'm aware, like, I pay taxes, and I believe in the common good, and I believe in social safety, and I believe that there actually is a positive role for government. And though, like, there is, like, all of this sort of, like, political interventions that we just have to be honest, like, have not been made in order for those, for that emergency preparedness to work in the benefit of most of us, of poor people. You know, like, the fact that, like, to this very day, you know, like, there's media depicting, you know, like, what is happening during environmental disasters, that, like, people of color are breaking into stores to get food for their babies, and they're looters. Right, and then like white folks are like breaking into stores, and they're survivors. You know, they're survivors. They're you know like they're they're the resilient ones. And I think that like we just cannot you know like there is something about like the way that like a lot of these institutions have set themselves up to prioritize how, what actually what wellness looks like, what safety looks like through the context of white supremacy. That it has in some ways like been designed to play into the into the plantation of like the white panic, you know, or like sort of designed to play into the plantation into the sort of idea of like. We're neutral. This is a neutral plan that works for everybody when we know that that's actually not true. And so to me, like, there is, like, a constant, and it is, it's hard to, like, watch it at the international level, but, like, people look up where Nepal is on the, on the, on the map only when a disaster does happen. And, like, what is that about us that I'm, like, what is that? What is that, like, that triggers in us to, like, that we're also, like, I don't know, like, there's something about, like, in the, and I don't think it's an American thing, but I think that, like, we have become a little bit of, like, disaster junkies because we're looking for something else outside of ourselves in some ways to like give us compassion or give us empathy for what other people are feeling. Like I need to see the visuals of how bad this was before I can donate. You know, or people ask me all the time of like what really happens when you're like trans in a rural community. I'm like, what do you think happened? <laughs> what do you think happened? You know, like no, like real talk, like how much do we have to know about people's like, you know, like how much do we have to know in detail almost, you know, like about what our people are experiencing in order for us to actually create mass scale solutions to address that problem. And I feel like we're still in kind of a social political space where it's like, no, show me the blood, show me the pain, show me the like hardship. And I'm like, for what? It's called self-determination. It's called our people are struggling and you either are for my self-determination or you're not. You don't need to know what's happening under my hands. Mm -hmm. You don't need to know like what my gender is. Actually, is do I believe in your self-determination and do you believe in mine? And what are we willing to do to actually like make that happen? And like there's like a way that like that there is like that's why the crisis is such a perfect step because it takes us back to like a raw human kind of survival emotion. And in some ways like that's when like it's also beautiful to see communities actually give it and say, no, we went through a huge environmental crisis and no, we will still not take Monsanto's like six thousand seeds because we know that it's gonna destroy our environment. What Haiti did in the aftermath of that huge earthquake when everybody was like Oh my God, there's such suffering. It's so horrible. Let's, and Monsanto's was like, well, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that you're all fed. And they're like, thank you, but nothing, right? And then like that was such a powerful, not just symbolic, but a way that they also reclaimed their humanity mm -hmm. to be like, you know what? Like this was a disaster, and the Haitian people will deal with it. And I was like, and at the end of the day, like we will not take your suicide seats because we know that like it's gonna be a part of the life. And there's like a way that like I'm like, how do we have that like, that kind of term of long term vision even in moments of crisis? You know, um, mm -hmm. so I'd love to like that's I feel like my constant question as an organizer is like even in our like worst moments of life, like we actually can turn to each other and make choices that are for like you know about our shared survival. And when do we actually have the chance to model that for each other? And I think that like there's ways to like, and that's why I love watching internationalist like movements and how they're evolving because people are coming from a different, completely different mindset of knowing that they can actually like there's something about class mobility in the U.S. that just like makes us believe that if your neighborhood goes down, if your house gets foreclosed. You can always move on to the next neighborhood. You can always move on to the next city. You can always move on to your next job. In a way that, like, I know my people don't feel that way about. They're like, we're not leaving that for my people. So this better get addressed. This better change. We will, tell, you know, like we will elect somebody new. We will fight. And, and like, there's there's just a different sense of rootedness that I think 
as like people living in the U.S. with the class mobility oftentimes that we have still, it's a, there's a hard thing there, I think, to address in terms of the priorities oftentimes and responses to, from, even from the environmental justice movement, right? You bring up the Can I just uh, yeah, add something to that? Because I, there's, I mean, that, I like that thing you mentioned about this kind of vicarious pleasure in disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, and that goes at different levels. Um, you know, I've thought about that a great deal because uh, there's a, what people seem to, you know, what we truck in, in a way, it's not like a weather channel syndrome, but what we seem to truck in is accumulation of distress. You know, you collect stories of distress, but we don't have a theory. And, you know, absent the theory of why things are happening, you know, why is the theory useful? The theory is useful because the theory will allow you to think about action. It will empower you. Theory will empower you to understand why things are happening. No. And it's a theory, so it's provisional. It has to change as conditions change. But theory empowers you to understand why something is and how you can create a strategy to make it better. If you don't have a theory, that accumulation of distress is disempowering. It makes it impossible to understand yourself as part of the struggle. Because you're weighed down by the burdens of the world. And I meet people, I you know, go across, talk, you know, talk about something, and people come and say, I just feel so depressed. I don't listen to the news, I don't read the newspaper, I don't want to know what's happening in the world. You know, How do you read the newspaper every day? You know, and that strikes me, and I, I don't blame anybody for it. But it's because as a, as a space in the world, we've lost, you know, through McCarthyism, through all these right politics from above, We've lost, people on the left have lost the capacity to have a theory, you know. Uh, Tony Kushner has an amazing part in Angels in America, which was not in the movie, called Perestroika, where the oldest Bolshevik in the world, uh, Andy Dunovich or something like that, goes up on the, to the plenum of the Supreme Soviet in 18, 1985, and he says, he's blind and he's got a stick and he says, you people, you don't have a theory. You're abandoning a theory. If you had a theory, if you went up to the mountain top and you were able to see clearly, I would follow you. His blind eyes would see that mountain top which is provided by your theory. And then he says my favorite line. He says, um, you, even snakes, my little serpents, when they shed a skin, grow a new one. I love that line. <laughs> we don't have a theory. Without a theory, you disempower yourself. And I think that's a huge loss. So, you know, when people say, I don't need a paper, I want to embrace them, not disdain them. It's not people's fault that you don't have a theory. It's that in this country and in much of the West, the thinking, political theory has vanished. And what's substituted for it is capital P academic theory, which actually doesn't explain climate disaster and stuff like that. It's a whole different situation. So I want to come back to that um, before I do this uh, uh, militarization question. You brought up crisis. And I think about the metaphor of the lobster in the pot of water, you know, where it gets hotter and hotter. Maybe it's a frog. Well, frog, thank you. Because uh, lobsters can't hop, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, frog is a Depends what kind of lobster. <laughs> Imagine it a lobster <laughs> point of frog. We need a lobster with um, so, uh, you know, I think that, you know, in talking about crisis, there's the twin crises of the economic crisis and the climate crisis that converge, and that there's still this sort of death by a thousand cuts um, that our, our metaphorical frog is experiencing um, that is manifesting a social unrest as, you know, playing out in our communities. Um, but it's not just the fortification of our military, but of our police as well. Um, and that I, I feel like we're, we're actually, you know, climate change is here, it's happening, um, but we're actually in the sort of early days of recognizing its manifestations um, because that, its manifestations are actually the exacerbation of that which is already happening in our communities. It's like this scaling up of that um, and, 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 uh, and it, and it seems that the response is um, at the local level of you know, coming from the police. So I, I'm wondering to pivot to social movements. 
uh, there's a connection between Black Lives Matters and climate justice. Um, and if that, if climate activists should be thinking about uh, their relationship to Black Lives Matters. Absolutely, I feel like there's a connection. themselves have begun to articulate deeper and deeper. Um, I should say that um, <laughs> one of the people who started um, the Black Lives Matter movement, Alicia Garza, uh, her partner is also on the board of SALT. So there's also just like a lot of um, both like, I feel like we get to benefit greatly like from their work and it's also been, um, they have put out such a strong social political call that like so many of our members and our kin and our political family have responded to. Um, and I feel like some of that has actually been, yeah, to actually like not be like not be neutral around issues of not just white supremacy, but also like being unapologetically pro, pro black. And I know that in the South, like the backbone of the environmental justice movement is like the black community. Mm -hmm. And it's been because of the honestly like the generosity of like southern black communities that a lot of these issues have gained a lot of traction in the South because people have actually like been willing to talk about like what happened at the like sort of uh, and to what's happening around farming issues also related to black farmers. Like that were some of the first people who began to also ring the alarm around like the loss of land by mm -hmm. sort of privatization of the state and all the things that were happening. And now with like sort of like the growing of um, immigrant communities in the southeast, it's just a different level of conversation. Um, but I would say that at the national level, like I've just been hearing more and more, like also even like Seattle's um, Seattle has like a new um, which I thought was kind of cool, kind of like an environmental justice program that's funded by the city to literally look at like racial and economic justice issues inside of the way that the city is addressing um, issues of environmental sort of impact to the community and actually looking, you know, the, like not just like, and we've known historically the like, you know, communities of color uh, and or even like some of the most sort of toxic sites, right, the like where sort of things get planned around the city, oftentimes it's where like not just people of color, but poor and working class communities do that, right? Um, and so like there's, and that analysis has been out there, like people know that that's, you know, like most of the facts that have actually been to like deeper the racial justice lens inside of the environmental justice movement has been coming from local fights where people are like, no, no, hold up, let's actually talk about who's actually like being impacted and then who should actually dictate federal agenda and priorities. Um, and that's just the way that I feel like the, the tone that the Black Lives Matter movement has set around like, again, being unapologetically pro-black and that actually does not lead to the detriment of a broader base racial justice movement. Um, and to actually stand for the leadership of people of color, I think it's just changed the tenor of the conversation. Because there was like this great report also that was released um, not that long ago, which I think is like the 20C report, um, which basically looked at a scan of like the largest, and really like just asked, the, um, asked all those environmental justice organizations to submit sort of um, information around like who is in your leadership, how much money is the organization actually, and just looked at like there's still a huge disparity in terms of the leadership of all of these organizations and the majority of the people the pay people who do this work as a pay in paid capacity, not that aren't just doing this work, but in like organizational funding, backing, who actually have an influence on federal strategies is still majority white. So, right, so there's like a way that also like the environmental movement is like talking out of both sides of this mouth. It's like we're addressing it, we're addressing it, and like we actually are not reflective still of like most of the local sort of not reflective of either like who's giving some of the biggest fight back at the local level. And I think that that tension has been on earth in a different way that actually has a different platform almost to step into. So to me, I'm like, there's like a way that the Black Lives Matter movement has actually emboldened in some ways all other issues to this question of racial justice as well. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the idea of movements being linked, um, firstly, any movement for dignity and justice is linked at that level, but let's go to a different, different level. There are these catastrophes that have been taking place, you know, for, in our lifetime, in the decades past. And responses by um, the advanced industrial countries have all been military responses. So there's a crisis of migrants on the Mediterranean, well, let's bomb the boats. You know, that was the European Union's suggestion. But we won't kill the people, we bomb the boats when they're empty. Before they, how are you going to do that? You know, we're bombing in Libya. Well, who cares? In Libya, we bombed anyway. <laughs> Playground for bombing. So that's a military solution. To what? To a climate war and trade set of disasters. What is Syria? I mean, what is happening in Syria? Between 2005 and 2010, there was an enormous drought. 
along the Euphrates there. At that time, the UN rapporteur for the right for food, uh, what's his name, Olivier Deschutes, uh, anyway, uh, he made a very important statement to the Security Council, saying this drought, this is long before the uprising, has pushed three million Syrians into extreme poverty. Uh, this war that broke out in Syria is not a sectarian war alone, it's also a climate war. You know, masses of people came to Damascus, completely disenfranchised, came to Aleppo. Agriculture was destroyed. Uh, in, so you get Syrian refugees crossing the Mediterranean. Who else do you get? You get West African migrants coming from six countries. Interesting. Three of those countries, their heads of government in 2003 wrote an op-ed in the New York Times called, Your Cotton Subsidies Are Killing Us. That was the headline. They are trade refugees. You know, they are coming to Libya trying to get through. Now, these are not just people who want, you know, our freedoms. You know, George Bush, man, I miss you every day. You gave me the best lines. You were the best person to despise, and the liberals weren't confused. Democrats in the White House are many liberals are totally confused. You know? and of course, they all go with you. You march against this war, that war. You're a Democrat, well, you know, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> why are they coming? They're coming because there are determined social policies that have destroyed their ability to survive. And then the answer to that is kill them. Build a wall. Make them fill the Mediterranean with crocodiles and have pikemen stand at the shores of Italy to push the boats away. You know, it's medieval. Mm -hmm. But it's not medieval, it's totally modern because it's the Rio Grande, it's the wall, it's the guys, you know, minute men and things. All these responses are militaristic. It returns to the earlier thing I was saying that you know, people who control these states have no clue. You know, I mean, I interact with some of them as a journalist. I go to interview them. I ask simple questions. They don't give a crap about humanitarian problems. They know the discourse of human rights. But what's much more important for them is they come to power because in their own communities, they're unable to deliver jobs. So they run on so-called social issues, immigration, abortion, homosexuality, etc. And therefore, their policy making is hamstrung by the fact they're not even delivering for their own people. They deliver a crooked imagination for sections of their own population and then take it out on people who are getting destroyed because of the global architecture. So in that sense, these movements are utterly linked. Because the fact that they have no answer for poverty in Ferguson and for the fact that people who suffer from mental health problems are walking around on the streets. I mean, a lot of people killed by the police are killed because the police are the wrong people to deal with them. Mm -hmm. See, I don't always blame the cop who pulls a gun out. They're totally untrained. Somebody, you know what? We should have cars that are painted a different color with social workers. If this was a real humane society, it would have 911 and 811. You know, so social worker shows up and says, listen, I, I can recognize you are suffering from this. I know it. I'm not, sir, move away from me. Move away, bang. This person is not trained to deal with that person. So we failed Ferguson for an international trade policy that failed Mali. You shoot the person in Ferguson, you shoot the person from Mali. It's the same system. So in that sense, you know, it's unbelievable that we can, when we make those charts, I mean, I've been in those meetings, you know, it's a hundred things, and then everybody feels disempowered. I can't do all these things. Prison, you forgot prison. You know, but prison is there's 31. You know, so many things. Well, I'm coming back to the point I made earlier. If you see there's a theoretical linkage between these issues, then there's something that we can understand that we can move an agenda against. It's not that I have to work on this, this, this. That's the NGOization of politics. I need to work on this issue, that issue. So let's put all the issues up there. We don't work on issues. We work on changing the structure. We have a theory of the structure. So I'm not interested in this <coughs> or that issue. I'm interested in all situations of indignity. So we have to not only fight against you know, the structure, we have to fight against this NGOization that's happened. 
where there's this kind of thinking of issue-based politics. And you know, okay, fine, you know, you're, you're, you're a radical, you want to change the world, but what are you doing today? I tell you know, people say that to me. What have you done today? You know what I've done today? I delivered 50 cans of soup to somebody. Well, what you did was important. But don't let your approach to the world infect everybody. You know, I don't, I'm not minimizing what you've done. What everybody does in their issue is important. Somebody wants to only work on abolition of prisons, that's great. But listen to a theory as well. This is not a zero-sum game. But I think that's the way I would consider the linkage. Well, there's a, a precept in organizing, organizing uh, organize folks where they're at, right? So, if, especially if people are personally affected by something that's a point of entree into um, experiences and political education that can um, you know, deepen understandings around some of the issues and intersections. So this is a related question to the um, previous one, but um, I'd, I'd love for you to talk a bit about immigration. Going back to the level of the nation state, you know, our responses are not just manifesting uh, in, in mili militaristic or, or policing ways, but also with the levers of legislation. And it seems the current fight around immigration is setting the stage for how we deal with climate refugees in the future and, in fact, how we already are. Um, yet, this has been um, a discussion that has not really been unlocked within the climate movement.
because in some ways it is like sort of tipping that that historical thing around like this mm -hmm. the sort of fear that you were talking about, but, like the fear of the like slave uprisings and the fear of like the, you know like the Indian takeover, and that to me is like part of what in some ways the right is so strategic around their symbolic thing, but like they know I'm gonna like their like their sort of face on fire, um, and that's one of those things that, that there is this like underlying resentment that is literally just also about poverty and poverty and about um, abject also just like neglect. Like I lived in East Tennessee for several years um, when I was working at the Highlander Research and Education Center. And I have to tell you, like, it's very hard to tell the difference between the global south and Appalachia, mm -hmm. right, which is majority white. It's also very, very poor, very under-resourced. Like I had young people that came through my youth organizing program who were white Appalachian, like fifth, sixth, seventh generation, like lived in the valleys and the hollers and the mountains, and like like literally like spent generations trying to climb out of poverty and still have not been able to. You know, so I just also think that like there's just a wider purview, you know, of like in terms of like even like how the immigrant rights like what becomes possible in this country when you're actually like, no no, we're all getting like like there's like a way that like we all have the boot on our neck. And, like what is that boot and like what are we wanting to do to kind of like to actually like collectively fight and like but the, the the question to me around immigration, like that's like such a that's like such a like a lightning rod question because they're like, no, you just got here. And <laughs> like you just got here and I'm still like struggling. Like I'm still starving. My family still can't. You know, like my little brother just killed himself because he couldn't find a job. I mean like all the stories now, but like but what's also happening in Appalachia and like so many other parts of the South that are not just happening to communities of color, like it's so painful and it's such a in some ways it's such the sort of the, the consequence of like refusing to believe that we're all affected by the same thing. You know, like it's like sort of constant political cycle of we're voting against our own best life interest because we're so unwilling for other people to have something that we don't feel like we have ourselves yet. You know, and it's just that it's just like this question of like we really, some of us like really are, I think, like building different um, some of us I think are fighting for two very different realities. And that's I think like the political struggle sometimes around immigration to me that it actually is about like, no, there's a historical tipping that's happening right now around this becoming a majority of people of color country. And that's what the panic is really about. It's about a political majority that really will tip things in a different way. Um, I want to hear what you have to say, but I want to layer on an additional question. It's, it's kind of a naive question, but it, like it's you know I, I've asked about um, you know community policing, racial profiling, Black Lives Matter, and now about immigration. And um, Naomi Klein in her book This Changes Everything sort of suggested that climate change changes everything because it's no longer about single issue politics, right? In order to resolve this massive issue, we have to interrogate and dismantle capitalism. And so you said, you know, we need a theory. We can't play this game a whack-a-mole in single issue politics. Yet if we're to directly address immigration, we're going straight to culture wars, which misses systems, right? And um, so I'm just wondering, you know, we're not talking about climate when we talk about immigration, should we? We're not talking about climate when we talk about what those matters, should we? Is it in fact like a thing that allows us to go straight to theory? Great question. Uh, so this is why I slightly disagree with Naomi Klein's formulation, that I don't think climate is the catastrophe. Uh, because I think that's a anthropocentric approach to uh, the issues we have to deal with. If we are taking a uh, human-centered uh, approach, poverty is the greatest catastrophe of our time. Uh, you know, people are dying and watching children die in front of their eyes. They're not waiting for the flood to come to drown them. Uh, you know, millions of people are suffering now. Uh, in India, uh, half the Indian population, 700 million Indians live in deprivation. That's a catastrophe now. So I don't, I don't like to play the game of what is the more important. I think these are, there's, there is a problem we're facing which has got many faces. And you know, your thing is correct. The more here and there. Okay, now the question you asked about immigration, there's an interesting issue. I agree with you. You have to debate, the right sets the terms of the debate. In this uh, country, I'm glad the liberals have an answer. There's no left answer, and I'll come to that in a minute. The liberal answer is correct. It's a good liberal answer, which is that no, immigrants come and they benefit the economy. You know, they work hard, they consume, etc. Therefore, we need a path to citizenship. Okay, that's the liberal horizon. 
let's to get to a left horizon, let's go to Europe. It's interesting. They create a European Union of basically Anglo-Saxon countries first. And they said no free movement of currency, because before the Euro, no free movement of uh, business, because there are trade barriers, but free movement of population. So if you're French, you're come to England, that's cool. Because basically we're all the same people. The problem of free movement became when they included Eastern Europe. Suddenly in England, they said, we want out of free movement of people. The Cameron government is pressured by UK, United Kingdom Independence Party, on the pressure of too many Polish people in track suits. It's, the, it's really racist. <laughs> <laughs> the women are out here taking our jobs away. So there's a great video you can watch of the Polish rappers, Polish and Brit rappers in track suits. It's like, yeah, we're here, you know, we're getting a job, we're driving a car, you know, blah, blah, blah. and these fluorescent tracks. <laughs> it's a really funny critique of racism. In the United States, when NAFTA happened, it was like the EU. It was the North American Union. It was the opposite of the EU. It was trade barriers disappeared, currency barriers sort of disappeared, but freedom of movement not allowed. Because of the Mexico problem. If there was no Mexico, United States and Canada may have said okay. And as it is, if you've driven across this border, unless you look like a terrorist, you just drive through. Mm -hmm. You know. I love driving through it. I have a friend who always does mischievous thing, I keep telling it's not the place, not this border. Because they're looking for us, they're not looking for illegal immigrants, they're looking for terrorists. Just be careful. Mexican borders are in Mexico, as you know. So we have the opposite history of the EU. A left position in America is open borders. There, there is no other position. There is no path to citizenship. And, you know, the, we had, during the healthcare debate, even we sat back and said, okay, well, you know, managed care, whatever. No, universal healthcare. Yes. Not even single payer, by the way. Thanks to fucking rich and give me all healthcare. You know? I don't even want to pay into this. Let the rich pay for my healthcare. Okay, that's the way it should be. So, you know. We, we surrender the position to the liberals. So on climate and climate refugees, it's a very similar issue. You know, the idea of a refugee comes from the UN Convention in 1951. That was a totally anti-communist convention. It suggested that people from the unfree world, if they come to the free world, they should be welcomed and given residency. That was the language of the 1951 definition of refugee. A refugee is somebody who comes from the unfree world to the free world. So they're welcome. Well, that's and This treaty needs to be renegotiated. There needs to be a new refugee treaty. There need to be trade policy refugees. You know, I don't like the term economic refugees. They're not economic refugees. They are refugees of international trade policies. They don't want to come to Europe and work as a janitor or whatever. They want to farm in Mali. But trade policies has made it impossible. US cotton subsidies has made it impossible. Your subsidies are killing us. So there are trade refugees, there are climate refugees. There are refugees from you know, corrosive social policies. People say, I don't want to, you know, I'm uh, you know, homosexual, I don't want to live in that country. They should have free movement to go anywhere. Now, I don't mean they need to come to the West, which is no paradise for you know, homosexuals or people, transgender or whatever, they may want to go somewhere else, they may want to go, I don't know where, maybe now Cuba, since the daughter of Raul Castro has led a big march, you know, God knows, I'm just speculating. The point is that there should be social refugees. Free movement of people. You cannot allow as a society free movement of capital, at least in this North American Union, without free movement of people. So one good piece of writing that Milton Friedman did, was an essay he wrote on house buying. It was brilliant. Freedom <coughs> argued that home buying is antithetical to freedom. What is? Home buying. Home ownership. You should rent. Why? If you lose a job, you find another place. If you bought a house, let's say you were live in Solvay, New York, and there's a big chemical factory, and you're a working class person and you buy a house, the factory closes down. The home values all descend below the margin. You can't sell your house, you're trapped. You are now a deindustrialization refugee. But you can't move from there. You're stuck. 
So we should rethink the idea of home, but that's antithetical to American aspiration. Because the only way to have retirement is buying a home and building the equity and then selling it and retiring. So, you know, I mean, there are huge issues in the refugee issue, the refugee debate, discussion. But in the United States, there is no left position. Unless you carve out a discrete position like open borders, you'll always be standing next to the liberal def defending them. See, why does a right win so often? Is that you have the moderate right, then you have the hard right. The hard right defines the issues. The moderate right translates it to the public. In the other side of the equation, the liberals set the agenda. And then the left says we have no choice but to support them. So where should we look for solutions? Are there key political, social movement moments or social movements here in the U.S. or overseas that climate activists should turn to? I think that there's some really, uh, some really great things that are, are happening internationally that I think we can all learn from. Like we were talking about earlier about the like the landless peoples movement, both in Brazil and in other parts of the world, where people, you know, like actually who have also been displaced in their own countries because of both like trade policies, because of environmental uh, degradation, because of uh, just like also just like social and political problems that have continued to sort of place poor people, and indigenous people, um, at the sort of cross sections of like you know all the other sort of. Um, Sort of, and yeah, just like economic sort of devastation, etc. That to me, like, has just cracked open this question too of like, what is the role of like a landless people's movement in Brazil? And it was so powerful to see all of these people who like sort of to this question of like, what does state accountability look like when so much of your citizenship, you know, or so your citizenship rights is connected to whether or not you're owning class, right? And the fact that people who are not only class are seen as like, you know, not just disposable, but it's like, in the U.S. is like, or we, most of us would say like homeless people, right? And that it's like a huge sort of like social stigma placed on people that can't afford to live with themselves with the assumption that the rest of us are not willing to do anything to sort of collectivize our survival. And so I think that there is, just like seeing some of the stuff that's happening with has really, I think just like even like for myself, like you get such a test in around like what else is possible and seeing so many, so many people actually being like, it's not just because we have a shared Brazilian identity, it's because there literally is an ancestral question like what's going to, like how we're going to address. Like all of our ancestors have made all of the sacrifices for us to be here. Like what are we going to do with the next sort of special sort of set of, sort of problems in our nations um, that I think has been really good. I would say that like, to me it's also just like such a, I don't know, like it's, it's been so um, powerful also to see that like, it actually has been like the farmers all around the, like the world have been the ones bringing the alarm around global capitalism and trade policies, so like the people that actually are deeply, most deeply connected on like a direct level to like, to what's actually, to that know that like you can only sow what you see, right? And I think that like, there's something, uh, like there's, there's always something there for me like around people being like, these trade policies are so complicated, we can't even explain them in a political education like session unless it's like three hours long. And I'm like, really? Because people all around the world are getting bucked about the fact that somebody else that they have like somebody from another land, from another, you know, like international global trade companies are trying to tell you how you should feed your children. Because for them, for love, it started there. It started with what's gonna, where do I get the seed from next year, you know? And I think that like there is like this interesting, like not just interesting, but it's like this fascinating, like just change around it too. That to me, like it's historical and it's been building. And I think that there's a way that technology and sort of, you know, the social sort of, you know, um, the way that like social media has really changed, like the amplification of what's happening that you see, for example, from the um, from the Zapatista movement in Mexico, but like the visibility of what the Zapatistas were trying to do, they knew that they needed more political cover to actually take on Mexico, like the Mexican government, to sort of you know in a more sort of um, in a way that like made that like they were not no longer willing to comply with sort of the Mexican agenda for indigenous people in Oaxaca, and they knew that like they needed political cover to do that, and they decided to go sort of wide with the media spread, right? Um, and that, like, and just like beginning to not just sort of like learning from the act, their the sort of ideology and knowing that, like, for them, like, it actually is also about this this question of whether or not, like, some of the stuff that's going to happen inside of nonprofits, whether it's going to be determined by organizations, or whether like, literally they actually have to oftentimes like be a different level of social and political struggle to carve out autonomy for communities, and sometimes like that's where it has to start to like elbow out some room to be like, no, actually, we're going to hold down this hill, so you come fuck with us if you want to. You know, and that I think in Mexico, it just cracked open a different question in Mexico. 
when people were like, hold up, what are we really willing to do in order to have this one plot of land? You know, and that like my family, like it's very mixed, and mostly from most of you know, pretty mixed indigenous background, where like even my folks were like, hold up, like people are taking to the streets and like armed against the Mexican government because it actually is also about visibilizing like the legacy of the Mexican Revolution, which was like a land reform movement that was very much sort of rooted also like in this idea of like Will this will we will we enter into another like five generation cycle of being on our knees? You know, like, and are we willing to do that? And I think that there's just like a way that like there is there is like a different. It feels like a different political moment like around this question because in some ways of like I don't know if it's like the end, like the, the visibility of information or like the internet or like the ways that like a lot of our movements are just like having like on like, a different sort of tipping point. Uh, that to me just like has yeah like there is like so much to learn from still. I mean, you know, there's a, I can give you a, a series of, of movements that are interesting and, and good, but let's set that aside. You know, basically every country gets its own fascism, and it has to struggle in its own way. And I think, you know, too often people in the United States left look somewhere else and say, you know, it's China now, Cuba, save us. Chavez, save us from Bush, you know. Invade America, liberate me. Okay, there's this feeling that if we get, but every country has to do its own thing. And, you know, Marx has a great line in Capital, where he says that the uh, white laborer will not be liberated unless the worker in the black scheme is emancipated. That's a really interesting insight from 1867. You know, the uh, reconstruction is on. Uh, you know, what Du Bois will later call the great general strike is going to take place in America. It's an incredible period. He says, I mean, this country has a serious and deep problem in uh, the uh, question of uh, lack of dignity and humanity uh, provided to uh, you know, people who had been enslaved and their descendants. Uh, whether the descendants were the descendants of those who were enslaved or they look like them? Does anyone might be enslaved with us? Doesn't matter. There's a deep problem of humiliation of populations. And, you know, I'm one of those, I mean, earlier we were talking about intersectionality. Uh, I mean, if there, are, if there are dignity fights that are blocking solidarity, the dignity fights have to be taken up full fledged. You know, the most important issue now is state repression against mainly poor people of color. That's the main issue. If you want to unblock a liberation dynamic in America, that's where we go through. It's not just a Ferguson, you know, these are uprisings. Every city has its struggle. Every city has its organization. But somehow those are seen as black organizations or you know, Puerto Rican organizations or uh, poor people's organizations. But those are the doorways to emancipation. You know, that is where we have to go through. Until, and it's not only necessarily building power in those communities. Uh, concurrently, there has to be work done, and, and this is also happening uh, among you know, uh, people who don't feel the other end of a police officer's gun. Uh, in other words, to uh, liberate people from their own anxieties. This is the road in America. You know, we, we can't deal with uh, climate. We cannot deal with issues of uh, joblessness. You know, I'm not a, a big champion of the minimum wage fight. And we can talk about that. You know, I, I don't think it's actually a progressive fight because it leaves big capital off the road. It pits uh, low wage workers against small businesses. Mm -hmm. And big capital sits back and waits for the small business to close down and then shows up with a warning. Because your mom and pop store couldn't get the, you know, the structure is wrong. We need more social wages, not individual individualized payment. We need more social wages, more goods and services for free. You know? Anyway, that being said, the doorway to emancipation is still there in America. The struggle in Brazil is different. The struggle in India is different. We cannot replicate it. The problems here are separate. The issue is that it's exciting to see things that way. Get excited, but not in the same way. But I'll give you an example. You meet a 60th generation radical. They'll say the following. Why are people now so apathetic? It disempowers people. 
You say that to people, why your generation is useless? Okay. Now I feel like shit. Thanks for that. You know, because in your generation, you were all so progressive that you ended up, you know, producing what? You know, what did you give us as an inheritance? You gave us a democratic party which is toothless and useless. So don't tell me you had such a great era. You know, in the same way people look abroad and say, wow, they're doing great work there. We are useless. I think that's totally disempowering everyone. Every country has its own problems. Look for your own doors. And I think this current upsurge is very, very positive. The issue is will it institutionalize or be destroyed? Mm. You know, I mean, I, I agree. You had said, mentioned about anarchism earlier. But I agree that when movements like social democracy or Marxism, etc., get destroyed, there's an enormous opening for anarchism. And anarchism isn't the stereotype of, you know, I don't care about anything, break buildings. No, it's also a serious philosophy. But the conversation between anarchism and Marxism is more important to my mind than one or the other. In, in this country, that conversation is a deep one. You know, they can learn from each other. Uh, they must learn from each other. But you need to institutionalize your teams. So in Ferguson, a built an organization. You know, Black Lives Matter is not just a slogan. It's a cry for help, it's a cry for justice, and it's an organization. So you've got to build things, you know. And I think there's a, you know, they always say when there's a disaster, the people in part take advantage of it. We don't take advantage of disaster because the disaster doesn't happen. It's ongoing. And we're doing nothing about it. And that's the... Uh, so how can we think about achieving scale with community-based solutions or um, mobilizing outside the state around global problems? I mean, I think that this is the this is part of the uh, what vexes me so much about this question around borders is the like the, the that ultimately like nation states are accountable and in so many ways like tether their political power on corporate interests which are international corporate interests in a way that like, has really, in some ways, like merged and solidified global power in a really different way. Um, and so I think about all, all the ways that like, sometimes like this conversation even around like developing countries versus undeveloped countries, sometimes there actually feels for both of them to be polluters, right? And so it's not even like one country being it against just, is that there's corporate deals that have been like made by their nation states to the detriment of their people um, as well, on, on both ends oftentimes. So I think that like, there is this question of like, what are we actually where where is the like the sort of like the pressure point around like I think to me like governance around and, and this idea of like the common good. Right? Because to me I'm like this idea of um, of taxation and also deregulation and, and anti and even the anti taxation movement was very much around yeah, like now we're seeing it manifested through like the libertarian agenda, which is the like we actually are progressive on social issues. I don't care if you're gay, but no, I am not willing to pay taxes so that you can have um, a life on your street. Like we really are fighting for very different versions of a, you know of like what it means to share a country, and so oftentimes like it really it to me like that in some ways like it has to start from that place of being like for communities like what is the purpose of like even like geographic proximity of countries like everybody wants to benefit from a big beautiful city like New York but nobody wants to pay taxes to make sure that the infrastructure survives like what's that about too you know and I think that like there is a way that that we have to be willing to build our own autonomous infrastructure at the same time that we're trying to dismantle some of the problematic stuff. And that to me feels like, that's where I do look internationally because we in the US, like the left has become such a surrogate for the state, like the not, like we know, like nonprofits, right? Like have become the surrogate for what the state actually should be doing. And we're filling all floods and holes and gas and services for what the state should be providing. Um, and so I think like there is a, like the way that like the, you know, I mean, who clarified this for me was like the, uh, the anti-violence, the women's anti-violence movement. That women should have never had to be the ones you know, bad women should never have been the ones to start anti-violence programs and agencies, right? Like, it should have been the federal government, should have been every single state, and it wasn't that way. Like, right, you had to be women who were coming out of battered relationships who were like, hold up, clearly nobody else is going to do anything about it. And then what happened was that like, the entire, then we actually, then the state was like, well, okay, we don't feel that role, we'll be over here, we'll throw some money here, we'll throw some money there, but y'all fix the problem. And that to me is just a total setup. What, that we're in right now is that the left is actually both advocating for the policies that, that we need, and we're so busy filling the like daily needs, the daily survival needs of our people that we can't do like we're we're not building 
scale with like solutions. Mm. Um, and so to me, like there has to be like there is like this question of like math and common wealth has to come into play absolutely in a different way. Mm. But to me, like this question of like taxing the rich is not just like some symbolic thing, but it's like no literally. Mm -hmm. Like literally, we will get to benefit from everything that like our people have to give, our lifeblood, our imagination, like all the work and labor that we put into making all of these companies successful. And at the end of the day, like what is the accountability? There isn't any. And I think that there and I think that we are I think generationally, like I see a lot of my peers who are like, no, I refuse to go into corporate work. You know, and it's like a, and that's not to say that like because people don't want to live, it's not because people don't want nice cars. It's because they have, we've seen up and like our parents is like we have this trajectory of like like making every sacrifice. I will be the perfect employee, I will be the perfect corporate player, so that my children can go to school and graduate. And then what's happening? My peers are coming out of school and college with like fifty, sixty, hundred and fifty thousand dollars debt. And like and being like, really? This is what our parents like sacrifice was worth? Like is this what is that is that really what we thought this was gonna take in some ways a sort of classic ascension question that it's just it feels like a myth. And it's a it's a little bit of a riddle. It's a little bit of a riddle to me in terms of like if we're gonna continue to pay taxes, like what do we actually really want out of that and what do we what are we willing to fight for to make that happen? And that to me why is why the Black Lives Matter movement feels really important because it's it's a different kind of state accountability, but it is opening, it's taking the door open in a lot of ways for that broader federal accountability for what the role that the role the positive role of government is. We're saying that there is a positive role of government, and if not, I'm ready to move on to the next solution. I'm like, you know, I'm like, are we creating our own? You know, I mean, and I think that that's part of why the left is important because there is there it gives us entry point into self governance and like, can we govern ourselves? And I think that there's this inherent. There's this inherent, and I'll speak for myself too, that like there is this inherent sort of also internalized racism that we have like believed for so long that we can't govern ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's the constant sort of setup, you know? But a related really question then is that uh, you said we need to be building autonomous infrastructure mm -hmm. um, as we're plugging these holes. Like sometimes plugging the holes is the pressure release valve that lets the big guys off the hook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but we yeah. have to do that. Can we also take over existing infrastructures? Like is that this idea of occupation? Institution, or is that, is that even is that possible? Is it strategic embedding or sort of commonizing existing infrastructure so that it's uh, unbind for the people? Sure. I mean, you know, the biggest community organization in the United States are the trade unions. Uh, you know, we forget that these are community organizations. They're local X Y Z. I think, in my mind, uh, so. I'm going to break my own rule and look at the Bolivian story for a minute. <laughs> um, in Bolivia, just as in the United States, there was an understanding that trade unions, which were quite powerful at a time when Bolivia had a national democratic economy, democratic in quotes, national economy, um, was eviscerated, destroyed because of globalization. Because firms disarticulated, they broke up, trade unions had less power, just as in the United States. So you had this highly, um, you know, trained trade unionists with really very difficult tasks of organizing at the workplace. So in Cochabamba, in Bolivia, there was a problem because Bechtel came in and got the contract, privatized contract to deliver water. And they tripled the, or something the price of water delivery. The trade union, one of its more interesting leaders, Oscar Olivares, uh, who is a trade unionist, created uh, a movement to fight against privatization. It became the water wars. What they learned in that experience is that the working class is both in factories and at home. In the 19th century, it was easy to organize the working class in the factories. In the 21st century, because of these new forms of production, it's harder to organize them in the factory, to organize them at home. But these are still class organizations. These are organizations of workers who are working in uh, in informal sector, unorganizable sector because they are some day laborers, etc. So they organized people in the neighborhood. They did slum organizing. And they built such a powerful organization, they linked with the Coca Workers Union, led by Evo Morales, and they took power in the state. And then they scaled some of the institutions. They captured some. And then Morales would come to the UN and say, Pachamama is the most important, etc. The climate agenda changed. How does that happen? Because they won power in the city. They took power. In the United States, I think the trade unions made a mistake. 
15 years ago. When it was harder to organize in the workplace, they decided to put their effort into elections. So Andy Stern and others went in big into let's elect good Democrats. Instead of pivoting to where people live and organizing the class in neighborhoods as day laborers, as I can't bloody have a grocery store in my neighborhood. Why did people go and burn down the CBS in, in Baltimore? Because there are innumerable studies that show that in working class communities in America, prices are high. So you burn down the damn shop. You don't burn down the CBS, you know, so the mayor says, we struggled so hard to bring the CBS here and you burned it down. You naughty people, you know, you burned it down, you ungrateful. They, it costs more for toothpaste in this CVS than in the white water town. So I burned it down. Why weren't the unions organizing there? Why didn't they go and organize collectives of people who are starving? Why didn't they create, like the communists did in America in the 30s, unemployment councils? People who can't find work, organize them into a union. That's how they succeeded in Bolivia and in Venezuela. The unions went and organized in the slums. Because unionists have incredible skills and commitment. They are the really best organizers. The fruit of a country enters trade unions. You know, at least I believe that in many countries, they're really most committed people. Because it's thankless work. Knocking on millions of doors, dangerous work. These are really important people, but they have been misused by trade union leadership in America by putting them at the service of the Democratic Party. They should have been put at the service of working class people. And that's an experience we can learn from Bolivia. I really agree. And I think the, like, the left was just gotten really tripped up by this question of um, that, prox that proximity to power is not power. And I think the left, there is a the way to like the labor movement. Like, I mean, I went into the AFL CIO uh, building in DC, which is right across the street from the White House. Um, and that's where they wanted to be. They wanted to be right next door to the White House. And so you can't piss your neighbor off that bad, right? Um, and that's just real talk, you know. And that's uh, someone who like does immigrant rights organizing, and like you know, know has worked in coalition with labor unions and with day labor organizations and with uh, different trade unions. That there, there's absolute discussion about how far they're willing and not willing to go, right? Because of where there's a political power and um, credibility comes from. That to me just opens up the question of like there have to be politically autonomous spaces. They're willing to do what is necessary. Um, and so to me, like, there is, yeah, like, there is a way that, like, the economic, um, the source of our own production and owning of our own labor is so central to that because that is, in some ways, like, where the of our scarcity comes from. It's like, will I have my next meal? Will I be able to feed my children? Which is why, even in North Carolina and, like, you know, in other, like, southern states as well, like, there's beginning to be all of this other um, lo local regulations around, like, whether or not you can grow food in your backyard whether or not you can keep chickens in your, in your backyard. And you know, some people are like, I don't want to hear chickens every morning. That's real. And at the end of the day, like people who want to be able to grow their own food, like what is the harm in that, right? Other than the fact that they know you have to go to the grocery store if you don't have that. You know, and I think that like there is, there's like this constant sort of social construct around that, the fact that we are only consumers. When, like, and that to me is a generational thing, but like my generation, like I'll, I'll be the first one. They're like, do I know how to grow something? Like, uh, I don't know. You know, and like that's the kind of like real skills. Like I know how to do grant writing, you know, I know how to do all this other thing, but I'm like, I'm gonna go for a couple and I don't know how to do that. So I'm gonna be feeding my children grants. Well that was really <laughs> Our struggle to live together 
is to enjoy the time we have with each other and to produce a world that's better. You know, that's why we live. Is that I, I love people. I love hanging out with people. That's where I get hope from. Not from some eschatological, apocalyptic you know, vision. You know, no, I, I'm, I don't live like that. I live every day of my life. I never ever wanted a career. I wanted to live a life where I could enjoy what I'm doing every day. Not what happens in 20 years. If you don't enjoy your life every day, you're screwed. I mean, it's, you'll be sick of this path you're chasing. So hope comes in the little and then in, in, in future. Because I believe that, I, I've always felt that, that there is a capacity of human beings to fight against the yoga of justice. History has shown us we have evolved greatly. We've overthrown all kinds of tyrannies. You know, why can't we overthrow this tyranny that comes to us uh, anonymously? The tyranny of capital is different from the tyranny of a king or a feudal lord. You can run to the feudal manor and put a pipe through their gut. There's no running to the bank and who are you going to put the pipe through? Where is capital? You know, there's no, it's anonymous, it's abstract. If we can overthrow those, we can overthrow this. I'm confident in that. I never lost hope after 1991. In fact, my results strengthened. Keep going, comrades. We'll reach there someday. But meanwhile, let's enjoy each other. <laughs> when the climate thing happened, I was distressed by how it bound our people. It was like a writing plot to make people depressed. I have my old dear departed, <laughs> beloved friend, Alexander Coleman, and I used to discuss the issue of climate change. Because Alexander didn't believe this. He believes a writing plot. And you know, I sympathize with him, <laughs> to some extent. What? Not that it's a writing plot. I sympathize with him where he was coming from. Firstly, I was in awe of him. And you know, he's an Englishman, and Indians are in awe of him. None of that, internal lines, so... Plus, he was just a brilliant, amazing guy. And you know, he, he knew how to put me in my place. You're wrong. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, there is a feeling that the climate discussion should not make people depressed. Because if you're depressed, you've lost hope in humanity. You know, you know the animals would be quite happy if we get wiped out. So, and that's why I don't take a, you know, this anthropomorphism whole thing. I don't buy any of that. I don't mind, I don't have a fear, I don't have the, you know, this Adam and Eve thing that we have to continue the human race forever. You know, <laughs> so the climate thing shouldn't bum people out. It should strengthen the resolve to enjoy each other, to fight to make a better world. You know, I hate meetings of progressives where everybody's depressed. You know, you're nothing, you did that, nobody came, nobody comes to a meeting. I didn't enjoy it, the fact that you're all there. I mean, like, we are here today, I'm so happy that you're at Saturday night, you are, what are you doing here? <laughs> Celebrate our presence. Not the absence, why aren't there 50 more people, you know? Who cares about them? We are here. If only five people came, we'd still have fun. <laughs> human beings, you know? So hope isn't that. <laughs> Having the hope of something better, because we are capable of it. Should not be depressed. I hate people who get depressed about politics. <laughs> Sorry, not hate. <laughs>
question and what happens, like the consequences of not responding to a spiritual question around um, our shared survival, what to me actually is about that. I'm like, are we going to be illuminated towards like a different way of life? And or like, is this going to be the wrap for a lot of people that quite frankly will not be missing? Um, and so to me, I'm just like, what's, what's the, what's, what pains me though is this, um, and that to me is why we, I feel like we have to have multiple strategies that are making strategic interventions is because a lot of our people are in a huge, um, a lot of our people, and I'll, and I'll speak for the work that I do, a lot of our people, like there is a, there, there, I have, there is a different, um, there is definitely a crisis. And to me, the crisis is oftentimes like around poverty, and it is around isolation in a way that this issue is magnified in a really different way. And so to me, like, in some ways, like, it's also like a question, a crisis of morale, as much as it is an environmental mm -hmm. crisis, you know? And that to me is about capitalism. That is about the lack of imagination that we have for our shared survival, thinking that, the, that our whole goal on this earth is to get a dollar bill. That is not our goal on this earth. You know, like, our goal on this earth is to actually, like, be life-giving vessels. And to mm -hmm. me, I'm like, can we move beyond that one dollar bill is the real question. Because that to me will actually crack a whole other set of like options open to us that we don't even think are options right now. Because we're so tethered to our jobs, you know, or we're so tethered to like what we have to do to hustle to survive. That I think when like, you're outside of that mind frame, like it's just, there's just like a totally different set of choices that think has to be made. Mm -hmm. That in some ways, like it will be fascinating and the rest of the world outpaces the US around this question, you know, and outpaces like our own environmental justice and sometimes be also to the benefit of the U.S. to actually see that like the rest of the world like is not just poised to respond to this question, but that there's actually a different path to return to wholeness, you know? And again, like to me, it's like this, this question of like, do we belong on this earth? I absolutely think we belong on this earth, you know? And I actually, absolutely think, I just don't know that if it's gonna, I just, it's a question of what generation is gonna do what's necessary to do what needs to be done. <coughs> The, the architecture of the answer was there in both of our and in the questions as well. Meaning, um, what is imperialism? Uh, imperialism is an interesting uh, idea which has disappeared from our vocabulary. Uh, we don't talk about it much. And you, you, it's a very good thing that you raised even the term. Uh, we talk about inequality, in the South, long. These are euphemisms. Thank you. Uh, I read a book recently called Imperialism's Past and Present. This is going to come out later in this year, makes the argument. You know, you have to engage with the concept of imperialism. Why, why are people like me stop using it a lot? Because they're also afraid of sounding like caricatures. Caricature. Imperialism. 
because people look at you and say, I, I don't believe you. So we totally need to believe you. You're right to say that it's important to name things. So what is imperialism? Imperialism is the use of extra economic force to derive economic benefit. So trade policy is an imperialist policy. Intellectual property rights, that's an imperialist policy. You, uh, currency manipulation is an imperialist policy. And then what do you do? You say the Chinese are manipulating their currency. But you do it as well. I mean, what is the Federal Reserve? What is monetary policy, if not manipulation of the currency? And I thought the right said, we're against fiscal policy, budgetary policy. We are only for monetary policy. Then they attack the Chinese for fiddling with their currency. But monetary policy is fiddling with your currency hmm. in a different way. So these are forces of imperialism. You are able to mobilize world opinion against China, saying you are fiddling your currency, stop doing it. And to pressure you, we are going to encircle you. We are going to put a base in Australia, we are going to come back to the Philippines, to Subic Bay. Americans left Subic Bay in 1992, returned 10 years later. We're going to we're going to, Hillary Clinton uh, exercise U.S. State Department uh, institutions to overthrow a government in Japan. This was very badly reported in the United States. A, a liberal government came to power in Japan when Hillary was, Clinton was the Secretary of State with the promise of closing down the U.S. base in Okinawa. When the government came to power, it won a mandate. It attempted to push this through, the government was overthrown. It was destabilized. So it, it happened. Now, not in Guatemala 1954, not in Iran 1953, it happened now. And the Japanese don't have the political might. And Japan is an advanced industrial country, third biggest economy in the world. And they still have to bend to the needs of a base in Okinawa. So, what is imperialism? It's utilizing extra economic force for economic gain, trade policy military policy, these are parts, these are the policy options of imperialism. It's a, a live and well situation, you know. I, when Obama became the president, I wrote the treatment of a one-act play, which was going to be like this. It was really a bed at a 30 degree angle. And under the covers are the president and the first lady. They have seat belts, so they don't slide. Some kind of device, like a, maybe a footboard, so they're standing up. And it's a very quick play because they're saying, what the fuck? What are we doing here? Our friends are Rashid Khalidi and Edward Said, and you know, what the hell are we doing here? And Michelle Obama is saying, I told you. I told you it was a mistake. You should never do this. Because now you're the, you're the head of the business. These are words you know. Because when you were an undergrad, you wore a leather jacket. You discussed radical feminism. You talked about France Fanon, and you used to smoke cigarettes and throw them onto the carpet in your dorm at Occidental and then stuff them out into the carpet. And now you're the asshole number one on the planet. <laughs> That's imperialism. <laughs> <laughs>
the environmental, like, environmentalist sector almost, um, to say that actually, you know, and that's why we see all these commercials now that GE is suddenly like the world leader for innovative, whatever, whatever strategies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, really? They are? And so is Exxon? And so is, <laughs> you know, and I, just, and I think that like, we just have to see it for what it is. And I think, I do think that there is more and more pushback. I think that what, um, I think ultimately is the same thing, right, around like capital, like capitalism and, and sort of economic interests that continues to sort of put a little bit of this like facade of the fact that like this, yeah, this like major polluters can do harm reduction, you know, and that's what it is. That's even, even at best, that's all it can, it is. And I think that like they have so much money and political interest that I think that they are the ones that like are seen as the only ones who also can provide scalable solutions. So it's, it's hard in some ways to like kick them down when we don't have a better alternative, right? So to me, that's the question that I'm like, how do we like kick them down at the same time as we're building actually like politically and politically autonomous solutions? Because that to me is so much of what's happening. Like I see it all the time, like in, in New Orleans, you know, like when um, the, 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 the BP spill happened. BP is like being, being now powered by the state of Louisiana as like, you know, like one of the, like that they're doing a great cleanup and that they're contributing to all of these funds uh, to support, you know, fishers that have been out of work because of the disaster. And we just know that like that's not actually true. Like they're plugging, it's, it's a PR move. And it's a, it's a, I mean, like frankly, like, like we know that it's a PR move. We know that it's actually like a tactical sort of gloss over. And I think that like until we're willing to actually like build some of that stuff without the corporate backing. And that's the question to me that I'm like, there was a choice to be made and there's like some political paths that have gotten made. And so to me, it's also like about like how power is leveraging each other for the benefit of that, because a lot of them are like, they are going into, like it's, it's money that's going into the elections, for <coughs> providing political cover for these companies to continue to do the same thing. And so I think it just, it's all kind of come back, comes back full circle. I, mean, uh, I think that's it, we have to close now, but uh, thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Love you.